Welcome to Microsoft 365 Excel, the complete story. Hey, this is MEX video number nine. And in this video, even though we have done so many array formulas already, we want to dedicate this entire video to array formulas and functions, looking at the full story. Now here are all the topics, and we'll definitely talk about the fundamentals of array formulas. We'll see the two main reasons that we use array formulas. We'll talk about some product, which is actually an aggregate function, but internally makes array calculations. And then guess what? All the rest of the video is all about 32 different array functions. Yes, in the last couple of years, we have gotten about 20 new array functions from Microsoft. Now, it gets better than just the video, because guess what? As with every video, there are a bunch of PDF notes. And this set has 26 different pages. Now, the cool thing about these notes is I go through the basics, where we go through defining each term. And there's an example right next to it pages and pages of all the terms and concepts we need for array formulas. Then on page 10, here's the list you need to know, a written summary of all the fundamentals. Pages 7 all the way to 9, I show you every single possibility of configurations when you make array formulas. This is probably something you want to read through just so you can see the wide array of possibilities. And then the remaining pages of the PDF notes have screenshots, including showing all the formulas with the row and column headers of every example we do in this video. And by the way, all the yellow sheets and all the red sheets, too, if you do Control P and Print, those are the PDF notes. All right, we're going to go over to the sheet Fun for Fundamentals. Now, if we're going to start at the beginning, the very first question to ask is, what is an array? An array is just something with two or more items. This column right here has an array of values. And we'll see as we create our array formulas, there's a few other types of arrays also. Next, we want to define what an array formula is. But before we do that, let's define what an array formula is not. Now, for this column right here, for every cell, I need to take whatever the sales is and multiply it by commission rate. So we'll create a formula that's not an array formula. Equal sign. I click on a single cell. Then I use a math operator. Click on another single cell. I'm going to hit the F4 key to lock it. Now, this is not an array formula because there's some operation. And on either side, there are single items. This formula operates on single items and delivers a single answer. Therefore, it's not an array formula. An array formula, of course, has to have some operator that when it makes its calculation, it delivers multiple answers. Now, this is an Excel table. So when I hit Enter, the formula is automatically copied down. Now, with a single input, single output formula like this, there's the formula. And in every single cell, we can see the formula. That'll be very different than when we create a dynamic spilled array formula. Now, in the top cell, I want to make a second calculation or a second operation. We want to round these. So after the equal sign, I type round. Now, in the number argument, there's already a single operation being performed, a math operation. But we want to do a second operation using round. So we still don't have an array formula, comma, 2 to round to the penny, close parentheses. And when I hit Enter, I've calculated in every single row the correct commission using a single input, single output formula. Now here's another example of what an array formula is not. We need to add all those commissions. So Alt equals to open up the sum function. And get this. We are going to operate on an array of items. But the sum function internally, since it's an aggregator, is programmed to take that array of items and deliver a single answer. So because this aggregate operation does not deliver an array of answers, 
It's not an array formula. Control Enter, and we've accomplished our goal. Calculated all the individual commissions and added. Now, sometimes you want to make the same calculation without all the intermediate steps. Then we can make the same column of calculations and then add, but do it all in a single cell with an array formula. Now we're going to type an equal sign and then select the array, the entire sales column. Then we want to directly operate on this array using a math operator. Then we select a single cell. Now right away, we have a direct operator. And direct operators can be math operators, comparative operators, or join operators. But as soon as we have a direct operation on an array of items, that means when it calculates, it's going to deliver multiple answers. And that makes this an array formula. Now notice we have a single cell selected right here. But when it calculates and delivers all the answers, watch what happens. Control Enter. All the answers spill to the cells below. Now let's learn a couple things about a dynamic spilled array formula. This formula only lives in the top cell. If you select any cell below, the formula is grayed out. And get this, if you hit F2, there's not actually anything in the cell. Escape. However, if you directly reference one of the items in a spilled array, like I need this number, and hit Enter, Excel is programmed to go and get that item. Control Z. In addition, since the formula only lives in the top cell, and all the values are spilling all the way down to cell G20, if I type something in the way of the spill, like a letter, the formula is polite. It gives me a spill error. That means, hey, I bumped into something. You got to remove it before I can spill the results. So Control Z, and sure enough, there's nothing in the way, so it spills all the way down. Now in the top cell, let's notice a few things. As compared to the single input, single output formula, F2, notice I did not have to lock that cell reference. Because the formula only lives in the top cell, we're not copying it. It spills, and we don't have to lock. Also, as compared to this formula, yes, the table object automatically copied this down. But if we had made this same single input, single output over in a cell, we would have to manually copy it, but not with dynamic spilled arrays. When I Control Enter, no lock cells formula automatically spills down. Now the third benefit of dynamic spilled array formulas is if we need to edit, we only have to edit in the top cell. And when we're done, it automatically spills down, avoiding with a single input, single output formula having to edit and recopy. Next, we do need to edit and add the round function, F2. Now. We already have one direct operator acting on an array of items. Let's do our second operation. We need to round all these items. That array of items is sitting in the number argument at the end, comma, two, close parentheses. Now this array formula is making two different array calculations. The first one is using a direct math operator. It operates on this array, times the single item, and delivers what is called a resultant array of unrounded numbers. But then in the number argument, those unrounded numbers are going to be used by round to make what's called a function argument array operation. Because we put multiple items into the number argument, which usually expects just a single item, that will force the round function to deliver multiple answers. So direct array operation number one, function argument array operation number two. Now, we edited this. All I have to do is Control Enter. And the rounded results spill below. Now in the top cell, I want to hit F2. And I want to look at the two different resultant arrays. Now in number argument, I'm going to click to select the entire array calculation. If I hit the F9 key, you can see those are the unrounded numbers in the resultant array that the round function will use. Control Z. 
And when the round function makes its array calculation, yes, this is the resultant array, but it's also a dynamic spilled array. Now our goal, of course, is to add all these numbers in a single cell. So at the beginning, I'm going to type the sum function. But don't be fooled. Yes, the sum is going to aggregate these and deliver a single answer. But this is still an array formula. And the reason is simple. If you have one or more array operations, this is an array formula. And that's important to think of even a formula that aggregates like this. It's important to think of this as an array formula, because if you do an array operation on 50,000 or 100,000 rows, that could take a long time to calculate, because it has to make a calculation for every single row. So even though a formula may look like a simple aggregate formula, inside, if there's an array operation, it's an array formula. Now, actually, this array formula has a special name. It's called a scalar array formula, where scalar just means 1. Because when I control Enter, it takes those two back-to-back -back array calculations. And then the sum function takes the result, aggregates, and delivers a single answer. And that was our goal. Yes, most of the time, you probably do want all the individual commissions for all the employees, and then off to the side you want to add. But sometimes you don't. And how nice to have such a compact solution. Control Enter. All right, let's make our second array formula. And so far, we've seen a direct array operation and a function argument array operation. Now we want to see the third type of array operation, a function array operation. And that's when we have a function that Microsoft programs specifically to deliver an array of answers. So when we use the unique function in array, if I go over to date and say, hey, I need to look at this date column and deliver a unique list. In this case, it's the function that's making the array operation. Control Enter. A unique list of dates spills below. Now we want to make an important distinction between a built-in array function and a normal function like round. Now round is programmed to deliver a single item. Round is not an array function. But you can force functions like this to deliver multiple items by doing a function argument array operation. But that does not make round an array function. And let me do a quick test to prove this to you. If we use unique, we'll do a silly formula on a single item. When I close parentheses and Control Enter, unique delivered an array with a single item. Down here, we'll do another silly formula. I'm going to round a number that's already rounded. And when we enter it, if we come up here in F2, F9, there's those curly brackets. That means this is an array, but it's an array with a single item. Escape, Enter, F2, and watch what happens when I hit F9. You do not see those curly brackets. This is not an array function, so it's not going to deliver an array. Now that's a subtle point, Control Z, Z, but it's an important one. Yes, we can deliver multiple items from many functions, but that doesn't make them an array function. Now let's try some more array formulas. Here I'd like to create a report. I need a sorted unique list of employees. And then from the Sales column, I need the totals for each employee. So in the top cell, I could use unique. But guess what? I'm going to nest unique inside of sort. Now the sort function, by default, sorts A to Z. So in the array argument of sort, I'm just going to nest unique. I point to employee, close, close. And when I hit Enter, there's our sorted unique list. Now, in the top cell F2, that's a spilled array formula. The formula right there lives in cell K5. Now, let's keep that in mind, because below K5, there is no formula. Our goal is to add sales for each employee. So the perfect function to add based on conditions is some ifs. The sum range, I want to look at the entire sales column, comma, criteria range. Well, here's the individual conditions or criteria. So for criteria range, I need the entire column, comma. 
Now in criteria one, if I give it K5 just a single cell, then of course, close parentheses, control enter, sum ifs delivers a single answer. F2, we're going to get rid of that. However, if we do a function argument array operation in criteria one, selecting the entire range, watch what happens to K5. That pound or hashtag is called a spilled range operator. And what it says is, hey, I know that the formula lives in K5, but I'm going to get all the items that spill from K5. Now, sum ifs is not an array function, but we can definitely get it to spill multiple items by doing a function argument array operation. Close parentheses, Control Enter, and there's our report. Now, you might be asking, why do we go through all the trouble of creating this report with formulas when we have pivot tables? Well, as we learned earlier in the class, anytime you want your report to dynamically update when new data arrives, then you got to use formulas. Now let's try to add some new data. I'm going to copy, Control-C, and up here, click. And before I Control-V, watch what happens here and here. Control-V. And just like that, we get a new set of unique dates. And sure enough, the new employee, Abigail, is sorted to the top. Now what in the world is going on here? I have some formatting. But not in the new row. Over here, I do have formatting when I get a new row. The reason why is I'm using conditional formatting here, which is what you want to do when you're doing dynamic spilled array formulas. And you might expand or contract. Over here, I just manually added some formatting. Now I want to clear this and show you how to add this conditional formatting. Home, over to editing, there's the clear. I want to not clear all. That clears formatting and content. I don't want clear contents because I just use the delete key. This is what I want, clear formats. Now when we're anticipating that this may expand, you want to highlight as many rows past the last item, anticipating the maximum number of items that will spill. Then we go up to Home, Styles, Conditional Formatting, New Rule. Use a formula to determine which cells to format. Format values where this formula is true. Now notice, when we highlighted this, the active cell is in the upper left corner. So when I build my formula, I have to build it from the point of view of that cell. I'm going to select this cell, and it has to be a relative cell reference. So I hit the F4 key one, two, three times. Then I have to say not, less than, greater than, and double quote, double quote is the syntax we'll use for looking for an empty cell. Now this is a relative cell reference because this dialog box in memory puts the formula in the cell behind the scenes and copies it over and down. So every cell will see this formula. Now we format. Uh, let's say fill. I like this green. You can do what you want. Border, outline, click OK, click OK. And now let's test it. Let's contract this. This is an Excel table. So in the lower right corner, I'm going to hover my cursor and drag up. That'll resize the table. And sure enough, that updates. If I expand this back down, there we go. The conditional formatting is working in tandem with that dynamic spilled array formula. Now we want to do another array formula and learn about array constants. Now I want the two biggest values, so I'm going to use the large function. For array, I want to select the entire sales column. Now normally, comma, for the k argument, we would put a single number. I'm going to hard code it in. This says, hey, get the second biggest. Control Enter. But that's not what I want. I want the first and second biggest, F2. Now these values are never going to change, so that's when you could use an array constant. An array constant is a hard-coded array of values. Now, when you create an array, the array is always housed in curly brackets. Then we want to type a 1. If you use a comma to separate the values, the values will spill across the columns. Then we type a 2, close curly bracket, close parentheses. And now when I Control-Enter, sure enough, it went through this column, found the two biggest, 
and spilled the values to the side. That means across the columns. Now, if you change the comma to a semicolon, then that says, hey, spill the values down the rows. So when I control enter, it spills the values down the rows. I don't know what that is. I'm going to scroll up and scroll down. So what that means is you have to know three things for array constants. Curly brackets house the array. Semicolon means go down a row. And comma means go over a column. Now the way I memorize this is comma starts with C and column starts with C. So I just remember that comma is column, and then the other one is a semicolon. Now Control Z. I do want to spill these down the rows. Now next, we'd like to look up the employees that are associated with the two biggest sales. Well, we can use XLOOKUP. And in lookup value, we're going to do a function argument array operation, left arrow. And to grab everything that spills from N5, I can just type pound or hashtag. Now notice that lookup value is getting values from the rows. Because the input are in rows, the spilled values will also be in rows, comma. We're going to look them up in the sales column. This formula will not handle duplicates. We know if we have duplicates, we have to switch over to filter, comma. And we want to get employees, close parentheses. And when I hit Enter, there are the employees spilled from the top cell. Now to finish out this lesson on the foundation of array formulas, we want to look at two more things. Remember our types of operations, we can have direct, function, argument, and function. Well, for direct, we saw a math operator. But let's look at a join and a logical operator. What I'd like here is I'd like to list the commission amount and then the employee name and spill the results. So equal sign, there's the commissions. And that's the join symbol, ampersand. In double quotes, I'm going to put space by space and double quotes, and join it to the employee name. When I Control Enter, it spills the results. That is a direct array operation using the join operator. If we come down here and make a Boolean operation, equals, I want to find out of all of these commissions, which ones are greater than or equal to. That's a logical comparative operator acting directly on an array greater than or equal to 60. And when I Control Enter, I get trues and falses. Now, on this sheet, we saw a lot about the fundamentals and foundation of array formulas. There's some notes here. But really, all of what I just talked about are so nicely presented here. You can Control P and print these out. Or better yet, just download the PDF notes from below the video. All right, fun foundation. Now let's go over and see the two main reasons that we use array formulas. We'll start off by going to the worksheet, making things easy. Now here we have our typical budget situation. Here's some sales. And the accounting department gave us these percentages or decimals to calculate all of the expenses. And here's how we did it before dynamic spilled array formulas. We had to know about mixed cell references lock down the row, but not the column, times. And then we go get this and lock it across the column, but not the row. And if that wasn't hard enough, then we had to Control Enter. And it was always a two-step process. Copy down, let go, copy it to the side. And we had to check, because mixed cell references are hard, and we don't always get it right. I lucked out this time. I got it right. Control Z, Z, Z. Dynamic spilled array formulas make almost everything much easier. Here's all we have to do. Equals, highlight all of these sales numbers across the columns, times all of the properly lined up with these expenses here, percentages or decimals across the rows. What happens when we do a direct array operation like this? is that the result will be a rectangle this dimension by this dimension. So that's all I do. Control Enter, and we're done. And of course, when we needed to edit, we'd F2, simply edit the very top cell. I don't have to enter this and recopy it. I edit it, 
control enter, and the correct results spilled. Now here's another amazing example of how dynamic spilled array formulas make our lives easier. This is an example from finance. We want to calculate over a number of different years and in interest rates the future value of our investment. We're going to have an initial deposit of 5,000 and a yearly deposit of 10,000. Now I want to dynamically create years and interest rates. So anytime we have a sequence of numbers, we use sequence. For year, number of year rows is going to be 8, comma, comma. The start is 10, comma, and the step or increment will be 5. Control Enter, and we're going to have 10 to 45 years. Now for interest rate equals sequence. I'm going to skip over rows because I want it to spill across the columns. Six different interest rates, comma, will start at 2 and have an increment of 2. Close parentheses and Enter. So right now we have from 2% to 12%. Now we don't have to know the financial math. That's this down here. We just use the future value function. What's the rate? Well, we have a number of different rates. And notice this is across the columns, comma, NPER, that's the number of years, by entering row values, the resultant function argument array operation will deliver a rectangle of future value amounts, comma, the PMT at the end of every year, we're investing 10,000, comma, the present value, that means how much is in the bank right now, 5,000, comma, if we were doing it at the beginning of the year, we used 1. The default for future value is 0, so I don't have to put this argument in. And that's it. Control Enter. I messed up because the cash flows coming in are negative. These are supposed to be positive numbers. That means how much we withdraw when we withdraw the final amount. F2. Both of these cash flows are negative. Minus, minus. And now when I Control Enter, the edited formula flows throughout the rectangular range. And of course, we can make changes if I only want six years, there it is, Control Z. Maybe the increment for interest rate should be 3%. There it is, Control Z. What if I didn't have $5,000 in at the very beginning? When I delete this, that's $1 million difference, Control Z. I just remember doing all of these different formulas the old way. And dynamic spilled arrays makes my life easier. And it's going to make your life easier also. So reason number one for loving dynamic spilled array formulas is they make a lot of things much easier. Now the next reason is on the sheet Compact Solutions. Now the second reason that array formulas are useful is because they can help to build more compact solutions we can create scalar array formulas that can eliminate unnecessary intermediate steps in the worksheet. Now here's an example from finance. We have a portfolio of stock, stock A and stock B. In order to estimate the total returns, we need to know the probability of different economic states. Here's a bad economy, an OK economy, and a good economy. We also need to know the proportion of stock A and stock B in our portfolio. Now when you make this calculation, normally you do it in a couple of intermediate steps. Now we need to take all of the estimated returns for each economic state, and we need to multiply it by the column headers and the row headers. Now it doesn't matter which order you multiply row and column headers, so I'll start with column times. Here's the row headers. I'll spill the results. Then we come down and Alt equal. We add all of these, and there's our total estimated return, 9%. But here's the thing. We really don't need these numbers at all. We're not going to use them for anything else, and we don't even need to see them. So why not do it in one single scalar array formula? We'll take all of the estimated returns times and this time I'll do economic states, those are the row headers, times proportions, those are the column headers. If I spill it, I get exactly the same results. But F2, all we have to do is sum. And just like that, we have a compact solution that 
doesn't require that we do all these intermediate steps. And in finance, you don't need these. This is all you want. Now I better decrease the decimals. And there we go. Now before we look at example number two, I want to go back over to make things easy. We created F2, this expense formula based on revenues across the columns. Those were the column headers. And our expense percentages, those were the row headers. Now this is an income statement, and we didn't do our last step, which is we need to subtract for each month and the total revenue minus expenses. So equals, well, we'll spill the results, all the revenues minus all the expenses. And when I hit Enter, there's the monthly profit or net income, and there's the overall projected profit for next year. Now, what if you didn't need any of this? You were just making a calculation, and all you wanted to see was estimated profit next year. Well, we can do all of these steps in a single formula, compact solutions. And we'll scroll down. We want to do our calculation here. But guess what? There is a problem with our setup, which this would probably be how I would set it up an assumption table set up vertically like this. If I set up all of these revenues, which is required for our calculation, but if we set them up to the side, that would take up a lot of space. And in order to calculate all those expenses, we do need column headers times row headers. That gives us that rectangular range of expenses. So I'm going to use a brand new, amazing Microsoft 365 array function, two row. So we'll take all of these, Control-Enter, and there's all the expenses I need for column headers, F2. And I'll multiply times all of the expense percentages. And when I Control-Enter, there's the exact same numbers. We didn't round them, though, so F2. Round, I come to the end, comma 2, close parentheses. Control-Enter, and if I look over here, those are the exact same numbers that I have over here. Now, I want to hit F2 and notice something really beautiful about this formula. We learned that there's three types of array calculations, and we have all three in this formula. A direct operation using a math operator, a two-row function array operation, and then inside of round, a function argument array operation. Now, our goal is single cell, so we need to add up total expenses. We'll put sum. And when I close parentheses and Control-Enter, I better get exactly the same number, and I do. Now all we need to do is calculate the sum of all of the sales. So back over here. And then we'll subtract the two, F2. Now I could put sum of all of these and then subtract, and that would be fine. But another way to do this is, guess what? We have multiple arguments inside of the sum function. And we're subtracting expenses. So if I do a new array operation, meaning I'm going to put a subtraction symbol in front of all of those rounded expenses, and then I come over, comma, and in the second argument, I just highlight these. Sum will add all of these positive numbers, all of the negative expense numbers in number one argument. And when I control enter, that's exactly what I'm after, a compact, skip all the intermediate steps, scalar array formula. Now those are two different examples of creating compact solutions. And there's many more examples. Now we'll look at two other examples where the math is beyond the scope of this class. But here we have the same financial example. And we have all these intermediate steps to calculate standard deviation. Well, sure enough. Scalar array formulas, there's one example. Here's a second example. Allow us to do the calculations in a single cell. As another example, here's an example from statistics. And these are a bunch of intermediate steps. And we really don't need them. We just need the final result. Well, F2, that single scalar array formula will do the trick. All right, so two main reasons that we love array formulas help to build compact solutions and make things easy. Now let's go over and talk about the sum product function. Now our goal is to calculate price times units in a single cell and then add to get total sales. Now we could definitely use the sum function, Alt equals, and then in number, I'm going to click in price, Control-Shift-Down-Arrow, 
Control Backspace. And notice, this is 100,000 rows here times the 100,000 rows of units. Control Shift Down Arrow, Control Backspace. Now that'll easily get the job done. Enter, and there's the answer. However, usually a better option is to use the sum product function. This is an aggregate function that's programmed to make array calculations but deliver an aggregate answer. Now, the product part means it can take multiple columns and multiply, that's the product, and then sum. So there's two parts, product and then sum. Sum product, the arguments are array 1, array 2, array 3. Each one of these arrays has to have the same dimension. So in array 1, we're going to put price in the top cell, control shift down arrow, control backspace, comma, and then we'll put units, control shift down arrow, control backspace. Each one of these arrays has exactly the same dimension. And here's what it does. The product part makes the array calculation. It multiplies corresponding elements in each one of the arrays. Then whatever the resultant array is, Sum will add, close parentheses, and when I enter, I get exactly the same result. Now here's the thing. Whereas this is a direct array operation, sum product actually has code underneath that defines how the function works. And oftentimes, that code will execute more quickly than a direct array operation. In fact, I timed these, and there's not a big difference here. But it is a 10% difference. So in general, when you're multiplying and then adding two ranges in a single cell, sum product is the way to go. Now let's look at a second example for sum product. This is a typical grading example. We have four tests, and there's a weight or a percentage for each one of the tests. So this is definitely one way to do it. We create individual corresponding multiplications and then add. However, in this case, it's much easier to use sum product. And the cool thing is for array 1, I'm going to put in relative cell references. That means as I copy down, it'll see each new row, each new student score, comma. And then for array 2, select the weights, hit F4 to lock, close parentheses. And then we can Control Enter, double click, and send it down. Come to the last cell and hit F2. Now, setting up a spreadsheet often requires thinking about the setup, because some setups allow more efficient formulas than others. So if you have weights like this, vertical, and then the scores are horizontal, well, those aren't the same dimension. So it would be much better to set this up as horizontal, horizontal. So if we use some product, it's not going to like horizontal scores and vertical weights. But no problem, equals some product. I'm going to take these as relative cell references, comma. And then as we saw just a moment ago, the great new function to row. So that'll take four rows by one column and make it four columns by one row. Now I do need to hit the F4 key, close, close. And now I can Control Enter, double click, and send it down. Last cell, F2. So some product is a great way to multiply corresponding ranges and then add. All right, now let's go look at the sheet array functions. Now on this sheet, I list the array function name, description, and arguments for 32 different array functions. Now I group them into categories. These array functions reorient data. We could choose a particular column, drop a row or column, vertically stack arrays. These will create arrays of numbers. These ones here perform different statistical and matrix algebra calculations. Here are some text array functions. And then down here, lambda is not an array function. But guess what? It's the first time in Excel history that in the worksheet we can define a function. Now, normally we take lambda and we save it as a defined name, and then we reuse that function. But these amazing lambda helper functions, they're all array functions. They allow us to define a function in the worksheet without defined names, and then run that function over columns, rows, and various other options. Down at the bottom, these are two functions related to lambda that are not array functions. Now, in our next video, we'll talk about lambda. But we want to see examples of most of these functions. So let's start it off by going over to reorient data. 
All right, on this sheet we have two tables. And we want to look at all of these functions. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 different examples. The first goal is we want to get top five student scores from both tables. That means scores here and here. And we want to list the student names. Well, the first amazing function we can use is vStack. We can take array, array, and a bunch more. But because we're vertically stacking, each one of the arrays, that's array 1, comma, has to have the same number of columns. If they don't, you get an NA for the missing columns. Now when I close parentheses and Control Enter, that is amazing. F2, and the reason it's amazing is because before VStack, this was insanely hard to do. In fact, in my third book, I have a whole section on how to do this, and it is complicated. But VStack, that is easy. Now next, we want to remove this column. But actually, we want to choose column 1 and 3. So F2, and we get to use Choose Columns. Now, there's a Choose Rows, which works exactly the same, but it chooses rows. So Tab, there's the array. And at the end, what makes this so easy, comma, is we can just put in the relative position of the column. Hey, that's the first one, comma, and the third one. Close parentheses. Control Enter. And there's the first and third column. Now we want to sort. So F2. And we're going to use the sort function. And this is another example. In the old days, it was almost impossible to sort with a formula. But you can make crazy array formulas. And in my second book, I had a whole chapter on sorting. But luckily, Microsoft 365, we just use the sort function. Now by default, it'll sort the first column A to Z. So when I sort and Control Enter, A to Z. That's not what we want. F2, backspace, comma, and we can use the second argument, sort index. I want to sort by the second column. Close parentheses. Oops, A to Z, F2, well, backspace, comma. Now we can use the third argument. The default is ascending, but we want descending minus 1. Close parentheses. And bam, all the biggest scores are on top. Now F2, we want the first four of this sorted list. So we're going to use another amazing function called take. Now take takes an array. And we can take rows from the top or bottom, or columns from the left or right. Now at the end, comma, let's just try positive 1. That takes from the top. Sure enough, that's the top one, F2. If I minus 1, that takes from the bottom. F2, backspace. If you put a positive number into column, it takes from the left. Negative number, it takes from the right. We want the top four, and I'm going to link it, close parentheses, Control Enter, and that is beautiful. If I change this to 6, Control Enter, there's the top six. Now sometimes you do want, let's change it back to four. Sometimes you really want the top four, but there's a tie for 93. If you want to include ties, then you have to do a different formula. Now a formula that includes ties actually has to take that number four, F2, and look up the fourth largest. Now something interesting about this large function, look in array. I didn't have to use vStack because most aggregate functions allow you to throw in multiple ranges as long as you put them in parentheses with a comma. But that 93 is then used inside the filter function. I vStack the two tables, then vStack just the numbers and say, hey, how many of you are greater than or equal to whatever I put there? Then the rest of the formula is basically the same. When I say give me just the top one, of course it's smart enough to know that there's duplicates. Control Z. Now I'm going to collapse this group right here and open the next example. Now we want to see the difference between two row and transpose. Two row brings something and puts it in a row. Two column is the parallel. It takes a bunch of things and puts them in a column. Now two row. There's the function in array. We're actually going to try to put two columns so we can compare and contrast with transpose, comma. You actually get to decide what to ignore, blanks or errors or both. 
comma, and we're doing default by row. So it's going to go test 4, 87, and then in the same row, test 5, 86, and so on. Backspace, close parentheses, Control, Enter. Now this is not the best use for two row, but we already saw some great uses. But as a contrast to transpose, takes whatever array you put in there, counts columns, 1, 2, that's how many rows it will deliver. And this many rows, that's how many columns it will deliver. Transpose just takes an array and turns it on its side. So when I Control Enter, there's the two rows, there's all the columns. Now, just for fun, let's come up here, because I actually do do formulas like this, because I want to put over in Word or a text box, test 4 equals 87 comma, test 5 equals 86. So F2, and we can use text join. For the time being, we're going to put the delimiter some spaces in an equal sign, comma. The default is to ignore empty cells, so comma. There's the text. Close, Control, Enter. However, I like the equal sign there and right there, but I want a comma. So F2, we can put an array of delimiters in here. Arrays always are housed in curly brackets. This is text, so the first item in the array is in quotes, comma, then in quotes, comma, space, end quote. Close curly bracket. So there it is. We gave it two delimiters. So when I Control Enter, every other one, test equals number, comma, test equals number. All right, so two row and transpose. Let's close this and look at our next example. I want to create three columns and show test 4, 5, 6, the scores, 4, 5, 6, the scores. So to use wrap columns, since each column will be filled with three rows, equals wrap columns. And guess what? It has to be a vector, which means a one-way array. I can highlight one column, but not two. Comma. I want three items in each column. And if I decided to use a number for word count and there were some cells that didn't get data, you could pad with and say what goes in those cells. But when we close parentheses and Control Enter, that is looking good. F2, and I want to join it in double quotes to another equal sign. And then a second wrap columns. Here's the scores, comma. Three rows in each column, close parentheses, Control, Enter. Now, we used wrap calls, but there's also a wrap rows, which does the same thing, but wraps to rows. Now, let's close this and look at our next example. Our goal here is to extract a unique list of test scores sorted by test, then score. So notice test 487, test 487. In the final report, we want to list only one. Now let's first sort, and guess what? We're going to use sort by. Here's the array, comma, and different than sort, we put in the column to sort, then how to sort, column to sort, how to sort. We'll sort by test, comma. We want ascending, one comma, and then by score. And let's show the biggest ones on top, comma, minus one. Close parentheses, Control Enter. Oops, we have something in the way. This is a spilled array, so we only have to move the top one. And there's the 287, so F2. Now we get to use unique. And unique, if we give it a single column, it gives us a unique list. But if we give it multiple columns, it looks at the records and gives us a list of unique records. Now, comma, we're trying to get a unique list based on rows. For unique, you could get a unique list of columns, comma. And this last argument, if you put in false or zero, it returns every distinct item. And what that means is it looks through and only returns items that occur only one time. So if we use that option here, we get nothing in the return array. Backspace, backspace. This is what we want, the unique. This is what we want, a unique list of records. And sure enough. Test 487, only one of them. Now, for this particular report, there is an alternative just using sort, but you have to use array syntax. Sort the first, then the second. And for that order, sort A to Z, and then Z to A. Now, as compared to sort by, this solution seems a little bit complicated. 
And so I guess that's why Microsoft created this second sort by, which is certainly easier. Column, sort order, column, sort order. Now let's close this. And we want to look at our next example. Now the last function we want to look at is expand. And I don't really have many good uses for expand. But here's a silly example. We want to get all the test scores after March 15th and then add the word last after each score. There's filter. That'll be the array to expand. There's the array. And for rows and columns, whatever number you put here, it must be bigger than the number of rows and columns in the original array. So let's put a 2 and expand this array to two columns. When we Control Enter, we get NA's F2. But that's where the last argument comes in, pad width. We'll say last. Close parentheses, Control Enter. And that's a silly example. Now, I do have one use that I have found. I'm not going to show you how to create this in this video. But sometimes we have a cross-tabulated table, and we want to unwind it into a proper data set. Well, we've been doing this for years. Here's the row headers, and we need to repeat them in the right order. We would normally use index and a number incrementer, column headers, index, and a number incrementer. But you can take a look here. I did it with expand, and it seems a little bit easier. There's the row headers. Here's the column headers. Now let's scroll over and look at our last example. Now our goal from this data set is to create a dynamic product sales report with total rows, F2. I've already used sort and unique back to back to get a unique list of products. But guess what? If this is dynamic, meaning I add new products, this will expand, but I need a total row. I need the word total here, and over here I need total sales. That is where VStack comes in. Now again, I have videos, and in my third book, I showed you how to do this without VStack. And it was hard. Actually, my third book has a note because VStack came out just as I was finishing my book. But there it is, array 1, comma, and we can just put the word total in array 2, close parentheses, control enter. If I change, instantly that total row updates, control Z. Now I have some conditional formatting to add bold and a double underline when the row has the word total. Actually, this is a preview of an up and coming video where that video will be all about single cell reporting. Now, here's what we want to do. We want to add, and some ifs needs to be dynamic also. Some range, well, we're looking there, comma, criteria range, product, comma, and we want to do a function argument array operation. Well, of course. We want that dynamic spilled array, so we use the spilled range operator. But wait a second, it has the word total. But for the time being, in criteria, we have four items. Those will be the conditions. Close parentheses, sum ifs, will deliver four answers. Remember, this is dynamic. So when it gets a new product, total will always be in the last row. So F2, that's where the drop function comes in. I want to drop from this array, comma, always the last row. So I put minus 1, bottom is minus, top is plus, close parentheses, Control Enter. Now if I change this, just like that, it updates. Control Z. Now F2, VStack comes to the rescue again. There's array 1. Array 2, well, sum. Close, close. Control Enter. Now if I add some new records, Control C, Control V, that is a dynamic report built with formulas. And guess what? Pivot tables cannot do that. Yes, they're much easier to use. But what they can't do is update instantly when source data changes. Now again, in an upcoming video, we'll see how to build this kind of report and much more complicated reports all in a single cell. But by far, when dynamic spilled array functions and the new Excel calculation engine came out, this was one of the more exciting uses for all this new array wonderfulness in Microsoft 365 Excel. All right, next we want to go over to the sheet Create Number Arrays. 
Now the first function we're going to look at, rand array, creates a random set of numbers. Now there's rand array. Rand came first. This is an argumentless function that delivers a number between 0 and 1 with 15 digits. Rand between allows you to do integers between a lower and upper value. But Rand between can do both of those, and it spills the results. Now, in this column, we want to deliver random numbers between 0 and 1. We're going to use Rand array, so tab. And watch this. If I don't put any arguments, it acts exactly like the RAND function. And if you hit F9, a random number is generated, F2. But if we use the first argument, rows, I want 10 of them, close parentheses. Now we get 10 random numbers between 0 and 1. Now all three functions, RAND, RAND between, and RAND array, use a uniform distribution. That means the probability of selecting a number is exactly the same for every number. Now to generate numbers between 1 and 5, we'll say 10 rows, no columns, so we'll skip it. And we just say min and max. But watch what happens when we leave the last argument out. We get the integers, but also the decimals, F9. So F2, in this case, if we really want only integers, comma, and in the last argument, the default is decimal. But if we put true or 1, close parentheses, there's our integers, F9. Now, sometimes you want to generate random sales numbers for a data set. We say 10 rows, the min, the max, that means between 1 and $5. And we don't want integer here. Control Enter. All we need to do now is F2, round these random numbers. There's the number, comma. I want it to the penny, so I put two close parentheses. Control Enter, F9. Now, let's notice something. If I come over here and do something, watch what happens. Enter. Every single time you do something, these formulas recalculate. So if you're really building a data set, once you get the random numbers you want, we copy and paste as values. Now, here's a great trick, because there's lots of ways to paste values. If I point to the edge, that's the Move cursor. Don't left click, right click. And when I right click and drag away, as soon as I let go of the right click, a secret menu pops up. Copy here as values only. Then if I F9, bam, I have my random sales numbers. Control Z. But what about randomly getting text? You betcha we can do that. Let's say 10 rows. And the min is going to be 1, comma, the max has to be 4. But I'm taking that information directly from the source data. I'm going to say how many rows are in that data set. Close parentheses, comma, 1, close. We want integers, so. And there's random numbers, but wait a second. That's not getting text. F2. This is where the index function beats XLOOKUP. Now, there's not very many uses left for index and VLOOKUP, those old lookup functions, because XLOOKUP does all that they did and better. But here it is, index rules for looking up random text items, comma. So we have our array, and there it is, row number. I'm generating random row numbers. So close parentheses, Control, Enter, F9. Now we could change this to 12. And for these numbers, I could change this to 100, and then F9. The last example will be for columns. I have my rows, columns, there it is. I'll just accept the defaults, close parentheses, Control, Enter, and F9. I'm getting random numbers across two columns. All right, next we want to check out the sequence function. Sequence will, of course, return a sequence of numbers. It has four arguments. You say how many rows you want. If you want columns, you can put columns in. And then where you should start, what's the first number, and what the step or increment is. The default for start is 1, and the increment is 1. Now, let's just start with the default. All I want is 10 rows, Control Enter, and I get 1 to 10. Now let's try 10 rows, and we don't want columns, so I skip. 
will start at 5, and the increment will be 5. Close parentheses, Control-Enter. So 5, 10, 15, 20, and so on. Now here are two different uses for sequence inside of other formulas. Our goal is to spill a repeated word. Now if the sales rep was Sue, we would just copy it, double click, and send it down. Sometimes when you have single cell reports, you need to generate the same word down a column. F2, well, we're going to do something really unusual. We're going to use index again. And the array, I'm simply going to put one item, comma, and then in row number, sequence rows for how many rows in the data set. So that, that'll give us number of rows. And then comma, comma, the start is 1, and the increment is 0. So sequence will repeat 1 and look up the first item in every row. And sure enough, that's what we got. Now down here, we want to investigate this text string here because we copied it from the internet, and we're having troubles with it. Specifically, we're having troubles with the spaces. It looks like there's 1, 2, 3. Now a space is character 32. And sometimes when you copy and paste something from the internet, you get character 160 instead. It looks like a space, but it's actually a non-breaking space. And it will cause trouble. Now I want to extract every one of these letters, 1 to 14. So I'm going to need a sequence of numbers, 1 to 14. For rows, I just say, what's the length? That'll tell me how many characters. Close, close, Control, Enter. And there it is, 1 to 14. Now, to extract all the characters, we're going to use the mid function. Here's the text, comma. And look at that. Starting number, we already have 1 to 14. That means we'll start here. We'll start in the first position, second, third, fourth, and so on. And guess what, comma, number of characters, we're always taking just one character. So that's the formula to extract all the characters. And the spaces look exactly the same. But code will tell us. And if we pound, we'll get all of them, close parentheses, Control, Enter. Sure enough, space. That is not a space. That's that character, 160. And that one was a space. So sequence came in handy here. Now if you're curious what all the characters and codes are, I have something down here. But if you search for ASCII characters, you'll find a list online. By the way, I created this with sequence and character. All right, next example. Sometimes in statistics, we want 0 to 6. That would be the number of x values possible. So we say sequence. And instead of 6 for rows, we add 1, comma, comma, and the start is 0. When I Control Enter, 0 to 6. Change it to 4, no problem. Another example from statistics, hey, we want the numbers 34 to 114. Well, equals sequence. And for rows, well, I need to take 114 minus 34. But I need to include 34 as the first number, so I have to add 1. And then comma, comma, we're starting at 34. The step is 1. Close parentheses, Control Enter. Control down arrow, and sure enough, 34 to 114. All right, that is a bunch about sequence and also about ran between, including randomly looking up text. All right, our next sheet, let's go to stats. Now, this is not a statistics class, but I'm going to show you frequency, mode, multiple, and trend. These are common enough that you might have to use them sometime. Now, our goal here is we have sales. And we have upper limits for counting. These are the categories that are automatically created by frequency. And using frequency is much easier than count ifs. But you're stuck with these categories. The freedom of count ifs is you could build whatever categories you want. But this is how easy it is. Here's all the data, comma. Bins array, that just means the upper limit. And I enter, that is much easier than count ifs. So between 250, not including 250, and 450, there were four sales. Now the nice thing about frequency also is when you put in the last upper limit, you might not have been paying attention. Because sure enough, 
there's one number bigger than the last upper limit. And that's why frequency will always deliver one more category than the number of upper bins you give it. And the last category, of course, is whatever's bigger than 1,050. Another statistics function is we might want to see which number occurs most frequently. So you don't want to use the single. You want to use the mult. Because with mult, if there's more than one number, in essence a tie for most frequent, this function will deliver it. And sure enough, Control Enter, 275 and 923. Each occurred two times. Now the last example is linear algebra. Now a lot of us don't like to do this, but it is one of the most common math techniques in business. Now you remember your xy scatter plot. We have some sales call data. This will be the x. This hopefully will predict the sales. So number of sales calls and sales. This is from past data. If we calculate the slope the longhand way, that's for every one unit of x, how much does y increase? And y-intercept is just where this line crosses the y-axis. Now, you could do it that way and then just say, hey, I'm going to take all these new x's that I want to make estimations off of times the slope plus the y-intercept. And then that would give me all of my new estimates. But if you don't want this off to the side and all you want is the numbers, you can use trend, known y's, comma, known x's. By the way, a big hint about all linear algebra functions is you always put the y's in first, and you always put the x's in second. Here's the new x's right here. We don't need this last one because we're going to take the default. We'll calculate the intercept normally. And sure enough, this one formula predicts all of these values. Here's our past data. Here's what we're trying to estimate. And bam, trend does just that. Now, line est is a funny function. It'll give us slope and intercept and spill the results known y's. There they are, comma, known x's. And if you leave out these last two arguments, close parentheses, it just spills the slope and the y-intercept. So if you want both of them, line est is a little bit faster than having to do it with two formulas. Now, line est, if you use the last two arguments, you have to be doing statistics a lot. But it spills all sorts of different statistics. All right, let's go to our last sheet, text. Now we have two text array functions that we want to look at. But really, we're not going to look at filter XML. You have to be able to write XML to use this. But in the old days, we would hack our way through this to take values separated by delimiters and spill the results. But we have a brand new function that makes everything easy. Equals text split. Here's the text. And it's very versatile, comma. If I say column delimiter, in double quotes a comma, close parentheses, it will split the values across the columns. If I skip over that comma, and for row delimiter, I put my comma, it'll split it down the rows. And there's a couple other cool things. Notice we have multiple different delimiters equals text split. There's the text. And now for each one of these arguments, we put in the correct delimiter. Column is a comma, comma. Row will be a semicolon. By the way, the delimiters do not have to be a comma and a semicolon. Whatever the delimiter for column and whatever the delimiter for row, you just have to put them in the right argument. So we can split this to a table. Not only that, but what if you really wanted this in a row and there were just different delimiters? We can do that. Here's the text. And in column delimiter, if I just put a comma, then of course it splits just by the comma. But watch this, F2, I can put in an array. Curly brackets, there's the first delimiter, comma. Semicolon will be the second one. Close it off with a curly bracket. Control Enter, and bam. No problem, different delimiters. We can split it to a table or to a complete row. All right, that was an epic video. We talked about text array functions, statistics array functions, how to create various numbers, a bunch about reorienting data. We talked about the amazing sum product function. 
We talked about the two main awesome uses for array formulas, creating compact solutions. And man, it makes things easy. And we started it off with the fundamentals. And don't forget about those PDF notes below the video that you can download, a complete cheat sheet about array formulas. All right, we'll see you next, next video. Thank you.